Steve Schultz, United States Marine Corps, Vietnam. I interviewed Steve in Independence, Missouri, June 29, 2007. He was 57 years old at the time. He lived to be 70 years old, passed away three years ago, folks. He worked as a police officer in Colorado and Kansas after the war and was just a great man and has a great story to tell from Vietnam. He served as a radio operator in 1967, 1968, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. And uh, again, he's got a really unique story. Steve suffers from PTSD like a lot of the Vietnam veterans have. And you know, anybody in life can get PTSD. It doesn't have to be in war, but it's very common in war. In World War I, they called it the soldier's melancholy. World War II, you heard the words like shell-shocked or battle fatigue. Vietnam, they started calling it post-traumatic stress disorders, PTSD, and uh, Steve suffered from that. But he tells a great story. I'm so happy to be able to share it with you today on YouTube uh, channel here and on my Voice of History radio channel. Once I show something here on the video channel, I take it to the radio channel and you can hear it. Folks, a lot of you have really been blessed by these stories and um, I just want you to join with me in honoring Steve today in his memory. I want to thank Daniel Stos again. Daniel, you've been helping me support uh, support my work and helping me get these stories out there. I, I God bless you, sir. Thank you for helping me get Steve's story out there and your dedication to our veterans, our country, and to this work that I'm doing. And I hope to be able to work with you again, Daniel. It's been a pleasure. God bless you. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story, it's easy. You can just click on the uh, video link in the video description of this video or go to my website, LarryCapetto.com. Click on Sponsor a Vet. There's a link at the top of the page. And include the veteran's name and I'll do the rest. If you'd like to donate to my work, there's information in the comment section of this video. And another plug for Voice of History Radio I, I, in, in the YouTube channel. A lot of you said that these stories are comforting. It's like some of you go to sleep listening to these stories. I was listening to Voices of History Radio today, mowing my yard, trimming my yard. And I do it. On, I do that all the time. I put my headphones on and go out there. It's, it's, it, there is a peace. There is a comfort. And I'm glad that there is. As we continue to learn the historical part of what they did, embedded in these stories is why we have had the freedoms over these years. And, and I don't want to lose these freedoms. We're going to fight for these freedoms. We're going to fight for our veterans today for the same freedoms that they fought for. It's a very important day that we're in. And at your fingertips, living history, folks, imagine. It's great. Get the apps from the app stores. It's for free. You can watch it. You can listen to it on my website, too. So, Anyways, uh, Steve Schultz, Corporal Steve Schultz, I might add, his rank of Corporal. And uh, I'm just so proud of him and his story and, like I said, his piece of the puzzle, as it were, as, as you continue to learn from the Vietnam War, from all these stories, and, and the Korean War and World War II, the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So a very historic educational documentary series here. So I'm excited, folks. Thank you for watching and listening. Thank you for subscribing to this channel and sharing these videos. And I will be back with you on my next program. God bless you. Probably the toughest question. How old are you now? 57. Okay, what year did you go to Nam? 67, 68. So you were 20 years old? Or? I was just turned 18. 18. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'm just, not good at math. No, I just turned 18 and uh, in September of 67, and I was there in December of 68. Okay. Are you with the Marine Corps? Yeah. You enlisted? Yes. Was there a reason? Did you feel a duty to serve your country or? Well, there's, uh, yes, it was very much in our f family that if there's a war, you signed up and went. My dad was a World War II vet uh, in the Navy, and uh, it was just the tradition of the family was, this is our country, this is what we do. If there's a war, we go sign up and we go. 
And so I signed up, I went to boot camp, and it was the hardest thing I've ever done. But um, then when I got out of there and got more training, I wanted to go to, um, to Nam as soon as I could because that's where, the, that's where the extra money was. You got combat pay. And that's where uh, um, you got the prestige of, uh, if you're in the service then and you hadn't been to Nam, then you weren't anybody. So, so it was evident you were going to go to Vietnam. I mean, you were in the Well, I volunteered for it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, were you a, a, a rifleman? What was your MOM? No, I, I, was, a, uh, I was a radio operator. RTO uh, or what do they call that? Is there a name for that? Just a you no know, radio operator. Well, radio telegraph operator. Okay. They were still using the telegraph somewhere, but I never used it. But uh, uh, that's what I did when I got over there. I was uh, I was an operator assigned to with a f a forward observer. Which division? Marine division. First Marine division, okay. third battalion, fifth Marine regiment. Yeah. At PFC or? I was a uh, Lance Corporal going in. I was a uh, Corporal coming out. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you remember, Steve, about arriving in country, what you experienced when you arrived as far as the, the weather, the geography. Yeah. Uh, it was somewhat like the movie, uh, the movie Platoon. Mm -hmm. um, we landed on a on a commercial jet, I think Continental Airlines, um, got off, walked into a, to a building, and as we walked in, there were guys walking out to get on the plane that we just got off of. It was extremely hot. Uh, we, had, we still had our stateside uh, utilities on, which was like twice the weight of the ones we had in, in Asia. And uh, it was extremely hot. Uh, when they uh, loaded the guys on the plane, they also put several caskets on the plane. But the guys uh, walking on the plane, they just sort of laughed at you like, boy, this is not good, you know. But everybody that I was with, we were scared, but we were gung-ho. We wanted to, to be there to see what it was all about. I think you want to test your manhood to see if you're, really going to be a man or not. So, I mean, you, you think about all the worst things, uh, what could happen to you, you know. Did you feel invincible? I mean, young men, sometimes they feel like nothing can happen. Did, they, did you ever feel like no. that? No, no, I didn't, not in Vietnam. I, I, I did after that. When I lived through several things that I was involved in, I, I did feel that, but not while I was there. Is there a baptism under fire that happens in combat? I mean, from, you know, where the reality sinks in, this, you know, I could get killed doing this? Or? Yeah, that, that, uh, that happened probably the first flight. Uh, I landed in a hot LZ, and uh, uh, it, was, um, it was kind of exciting. Everyone was saying, okay, this is a hot LZ, and when we get there, there's going to be people shooting at you. And... and um, so we got there, and yeah, there were people shooting at us. And uh, yeah, w once you got off the helicopter, got to a certain place uh, where you could form up with the rest of the guys, then you felt like, uh, yeah, I made it, you know, because you saw a few other people fall or die, get killed while you were getting off. So you're lucky. Know, to get there. So you spent time being transported in LZs by helicopter? Yes. Well, did you do a lot of that or just a little bit of that? or? We probably made, I probably rode 20 helicopter rides, uh, maybe 12 of them for combat incursions and the rest of them are being medevaced out or whatever. So. Can you take me on a mission, what it's like getting picked up on the tarmac, the choppers coming in, getting on, and then getting off into maybe a hot LZ, what that's like? Yeah, um, we, uh, we formed up by squads, about 12 to 15 guys. Got on each, uh, they would fly in about four or five choppers. We'd get on, uh, fly out to the LZ, we'd have a couple of... Uh, uh, Huey's with us for to use their guns to soften up the area, 
But the, the one, the first one that I went to was um, uh, we uh, we were coming in to assist a company that had been assaulted, uh, that had been hit pretty bad. They had lots of casualties, and so we were coming in to reinforce them and to to pick up their casualties. So uh, when we landed, or as we were coming down, uh, a bullet came up through the floor of the helicopter and hit the guy next to me in, in his heel, knocked his leg up in the air. And uh, everybody's sitting on their helmet. The, there's no reason to wear your helmet because everything's coming up through there. You wanted the helmet between you and, and your family jewels, you know? And uh, so uh, uh, then the crew chief in the back, he, he was calling off the, how many feet we were from the ground, 20, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The ramp went down, and about that time, a guy, two guys over from me, we were seated, sit on the outboard side of the helicopter with our backs to the outside. We're, we're facing each other. The guy about two people over got shot in the back and fell into the, into the walkway there. Uh, we didn't have time to check on him. We were going to, we just left him, and then we, um, went out the ramp, and the only inst instructions I had was when you hit the ground, go left to the first tree line. And uh, I jumped off the helicopter and was in about two feet of mud and couldn't even move. And there were bullets hitting the mud around you and uh, stuff, and so you're pulling through trying to get out, and I had my radio, I weighed a ton, and. Um, I finally got to the tree line, and uh, mass, uh, mass, mass confusion. <clears throat> um, and a, a sergeant I didn't even know came up to me and said, uh, told me to change to a different frequency so he could talk to his guys. And I said, well, I don't know where my FO is, my core reserver. I said, but I got to stay on his frequency. No, you just changed it. So he just changed it. So from then on, I was, uh, my FO had gotten killed when he got off the helicopter. So I was there without an FO and uh, uh, the other grunts, they were using my radio because they lost some radio men. So, but after uh, the helicopter took off, there were no more shots being fired you know, into the LZ. And uh, we were kind of, we kind of got grouped up and went over to what would be like the southwest side of this LZ. The LZ is like a, was about the size of a football field maybe or half that size. And as we're walking over to where we were going to form up, there was about 25 dead guys there with the ponchos over them. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it had been a heck of a firefight, and all these guys were dead. So uh, you knew what you were getting into. But being uh, being in Vietnam and trying to be older than you were, and you act like it didn't bother you. You just walk past those guys. You, that might scare you, but you said, oh, "I'm alive now." So. Um, so anyway, that's how we got off the LZ, and uh, then from there we did like a sweep into the village and uh, uh, drove the enemy out. Uh, it, it was uh, there weren't that many enemy there uh, at that time. Their usual techniques was to hit and run, and, and uh, they didn't stay around to fight. So you fight the VC, the North Vietnamese. Well, mostly the VC. Uh, there was a time when uh, we got overrun one night that uh, there were we had we had NVA regulars there. There was also two Chinese advisors that we killed, and um, they were uh, in good uniforms and they had uh, their hands were manicured and all that stuff. So we knew they had to be officers and they were Chinese. So. That, that's the first time that uh, made me think about uh, 
communism, and this is, uh, this is why we're here. This is what we were told. This is why we're here. Communism, if you don't stop it here, it's going to go on down to Australia, then it's going to come over to the U.S. And uh, uh, we, we, th we thought that was a possibility. Um, and that's what we were fighting for. So. Well, that leads me to, well, I think it's several things, but the purpose of you being in Vietnam, you kind of just said it, but yeah. was that common among the other troops, or was uh, the people get disillusioned at times of why they were there? Or? We, we didn't get disillusioned, as I recall, while we were there. Because what, once you get there, you're fighting just to stay alive, just to make it to your day of rotation. Um, and you're, you're, you're fighting because they killed or wounded somebody that you know. That's uh, this thing about communism and, and all that didn't play any part. You were just fighting uh, because these guys had killed someone or they were trying to kill you. So you wanted to kill them first. And um, it was just war. And it's a, it's a horrible thing, you know, it's war. But you want to, you want to stay alive the best you can and uh, so you do what you have to do. Were there times where you were called upon to help with the wounded or, or evacuate the wounded on the helicopters? Can yeah. you tell me a story of how, of maybe where you were and what was happening? Oh, uh, I can tell you some horrible stories or I can tell you some average stories. Average is fine. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, there, there were, uh, being a radio operator, I was often called on to, to talk to the helicopters, to bring them into the LZs and to get the, the people loaded on them. Most of the time they were coming in with uh, mail or water or, or something for us. <clears throat> and um, then they would drop that off, and they would pick up wounded or, or the dead. Um, and uh, whenever there was a helicopter around, it always drew fire, or sh seemed to. But uh, we'd pop it yellow smoke, and it'd fly right in on it. They're, the, those guys are great pilots, and uh, we'd load up what we had to. Some guys couldn't walk. Uh, you'd carry them out there to the chopper and th throw them on and then get back out of the way. So uh, it was just something that you did, you know. Friends that were wounded or killed over there, Steve? Did you lose a lot of buddies or? I lost a couple. One very good friend, a guy named Terry Brady. Uh, it was the night we got overrun and he got, he got killed in the first wave, in the first shooting. And uh, uh, it was pretty traumatic, but the rest of that night was spent trying to stay alive, so I didn't get to think about it till, till later. Um, it was, uh, yeah, he was a real good friend. Uh, uh, there's another guy named Gordon Critchfield. He, uh, he was wounded. Uh, he was a guy from rural Colorado, uh, and he was just hysterical funny all the time. And it really kept us going, you know. Uh, but the last time I saw him, he was in a VA hospital suffering from mental problems, uh, which a lot of us have. So, you know. so you're over there for a year? 12 months, 27 days. Were you wounded at all? Or? I had three minor wounds, nothing spectacular. And one was a, one was a, a concussion wound. I don't know why I can't talk. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, I had two small wounds and then a concussion wound where I was blown out of a truck onto my radio in my head. And it's probably why I'm like I am now. Was, uh, was the fighting in Vietnam, I mean, did you go, was it sporadic? Was it sniper fire? Were there heavy firefights or all of the above? I, mean, I, I was with a uh, grunt company. Uh, and we uh, were based in a rear area, uh, and we would set up uh, some search and destroy missions. Uh, so for any given month, we, we'd have maybe seven days in the field 
doing search and destroy, and then we'd have uh, maybe five days in the rear. Then we'd be on bridge, uh, bridge security, which means we set up and, and guarded a bridge, and that may go on for a week or two. And then uh, after that, uh, we would be a quick reaction force and that's about what we did each time. So we were only in the rear maybe four or five days out of the month. We were in the field the rest of the time. Um, there were snipers. Every, every day we were in the field was the day you could get shot. Um, and in the rear, you could get mortared any day, and several people got killed that way. They thought that, you know, we were in the rear area, but they still were able to to attack us. Um, so it's living with a constant fear that you're going to get hurt or die. Well, you actually don't ever think about getting hurt. You think about dying. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, I lost my train of thought. Got run over by that train. Um, it, but anyway, um, we, uh, there, there was a lot of unique things about being there. We uh, went out, we were in Anwa, which is south of Da Nang, about 10 miles. And there was a German hospital there, run by some German nationals. And um, we were able to go over and we would, uh, we would guard them from them being ambushed or, or uh, attacked at night. But the fact of the matter is, in the middle of the night, the Viet Cong would bring their wounded in there and the Germans would treat them. And the Germans were, were neutral in the Vietnam War, and so um, they would treat whoever came to their door. So uh, that was kind of a strange thing. Is that we knew they were treating the enemy, but uh, there isn't anything you could do about it. So. Uh, there's a lot of things that happened over there. What was the hardest part of your tour or a situation maybe you encountered uh, in Vietnam? Was there a harder part about your work? Did you say you're a rifleman? No, I'm a radio operator. Yeah, I'm sorry, radio yeah. Okay. Well, I know Avery yeah. Marine's a rifleman, but... Yes. Right, 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 yes. Uh, is it, was, was there a harder day than the next? Probably not. There were... Um, days when you just wanted it to be over. And there's nothing better than living through a, f a firefight at night and the sun coming up and you know that you lived through it. That, that's the feeling you can't, that's a high you can't get anywhere. And the guys came back to the U.S. and tried to, to get that high again and they couldn't. Um, but it's, it's a feeling you, it, that's incredible that you're having this uh, life-changing experience and you live through it and you, uh, you uh, want to go on to the next day. Um, so there was like a, an adrenaline rush to combat and then maybe when the combat was over, was there a, a severe letdown of sorts, physically and emotionally? Or? Yes, maybe. I can't really recall that. I can recall, now that you bring that up, I can recall, um, even though there might have been a fast ambush or something like that, and then the danger was gone, I'm still worried about getting shot from, a, from the next ambush. So it was a constant state of uh, you could get killed anytime. And it didn't, it didn't really have its highs and lows because we never really went to a safe area. Uh, I know one time we went into, to, uh, into, uh, went into Da Nang, and all the guys in there, all the servicemen had on starched uniforms and polished boots, and, and uh, we were, we hadn't seen a shower for 20 days probably, and hadn't shaved, and, uh, clothes were covered with mud and people even the servicemen looked at us like like we were some weird thing you know uh, so only a, 
Uh, a lot of guys who were in Nam didn't make it into the field, but that's that's okay because you need the cooks and you need the chaplains and you need everything, all all those people to m make sure you get things done right. So, uh, but anyway, there was no I, I I don't remember any feeling of okay it's over, except like that I say I lived through it, mm -hmm. but the very next thing. I, I could get shot the very next minute, so it wasn't that important. <laughs> was the uncertainty of Vietnam stressful? I mean, um, I think of World War II, the fighting in Korea, even today, but Vietnam, was there a lot of uncertainty, a guerrilla-type warfare? Did that add to the stress of what you had to do? Well, there's uh, the booby traps over there were pretty bad. There's a lot of guys got there, got killed with the booby traps and those are probably more horrifying than uh, uh, having uh, being a, 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 a firefight. You 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 uh, you don't have anyone to fight against if this booby trap goes off, kind of like the the IEDs in in Iraq. Uh, but uh, I saw guys kill with with booby traps, and and I saw a guy get his foot blown off, and the only thing he had to say was, "I'm going home." And he was he was fine with what happened to him because he wanted out of there, and and all of us wanted out of there. Uh, but we knew we had to stay. And when it got down to you had less than a month left, and they called you short. You were short time. We had short time left, um, and it seemed like most of the people who got killed they either got killed in the first month they were there or in the last month. It's just a strange thing. Um, but then when you really got short, down to the last week, then they, they would take you out of the field and put you in the rear area. And um, then you're laying there in the rear area waiting for the mortar to come in and hit your tent and, and do an air burst and kill you. So, and you got no way to, to fight that. Um. As a radio operator, you talked about the helicopters. And you would would you call in the medevacs? Is that something that you? Would yes, do? I would. Some of the time, yes. So I would if you're call out them. in a situation, maybe you can think of a situation, but uh, one man goes down or several go down. Does the commander say call a medevac, or do you just decide to do it yourself, or what? No, he would. Uh, he would say call one, and then you have to give a priority, and he would have to assign that priority. Um, what are the levels of priority? High, medium, low, or how does that work? I don't remember what what they were labeled, um, but they basically stood for "come and pick the guy up when you have a chance," or "we need you in here as soon as feasibly possible," uh, but don't do anything out of the ordinary. Or the top one is, "we got to have a chopper now, right now." And um, the medevacs come in when they were it was a hot LZ. Yes. They would land if there was a hot LZ, and uh, uh, those chopper pilots were great. If they were on station and they came in, they usually brought a, uh, a gunship with them who sprayed down the area and tried to keep it. But uh, I saw medevac choppers get shot down, and uh, I saw jets get shot down too. But uh, uh, What do you do at that time? You just you're looking over here, it's happening, or you, you, you really tuned into that, you go over there and help, or what? Well, yeah, the first thing you do, like when the chopper went down, it's like, uh, yeah, you want to rush there and see if you can, uh, it, it, it hadn't gotten very high up in the air, and it kind of went over on its side, and so it wasn't uh, a very traumatic, explosive thing. So, yeah, you went over there, but someone has to stay on the lines to keep the enemy from coming in to get you, too. So you, you have to, since I was in the LZ, then I could go over there. To, you know, to the helicopter. Um, but I did a lot of things on the radio. I was a forward observer and called in artillery and mortars and airstrikes, and uh, uh, it, it, you spent a lot of time doing that. And uh, uh, there's those those things involve friendly fire incidents and. Uh, it's it's horrible. It's tragic, and but there isn't anything that you can do about it. So, 
I mean, we hear about friendly fire, you know, problems now, but we had that problem. And there's always been a problem, world, you know, in any war. It's just a, the cost of doing war. Well, when you're over there fighting, Steve, are you conscious of fighting for your country, or is it just a matter of survival? It's a matter of you want to stay alive. You want to stay alive so you can go home. It doesn't have to do with you're not... In Vietnam, we weren't. We didn't feel like we were protecting the, the shores of, of, of the U.S. <clears throat> As opposed to World War II, they probably felt like, the, you know, by keeping the Japanese or the Germans away that they... That they uh, they had to fight to to do that uh, because we in World War II they had subs off off the east and west coast during the war and so it was bringing it close to home. Whereas it, we didn't have that feeling. I'm I'm sure the troops in Iraq have a similar problem too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah there's there's. Uh, Looking back on 30-some years ago, 40 years ago, uh, things were a lot different in the world. Uh, and uh, people came back from the war. Some of them weren't treated well. Some of them were treated as heroes, but most of us weren't. Um, and it was a uh, an experience that... I wouldn't wish on any enemy, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. But it's but it's an experience that has cost me a, a, a lot in my personal life since then. It's cost me dearly. Uh, choices that I've made can be related back to that. I have uh, PTSD. Uh, the VA gives me money for that, and that's. That doesn't have anything to do with it. I just wish I didn't have the feelings that I have. Um, but I can't imagine uh, coming back, losing an arm or a leg, how bad that would be. Um, there's, uh, the world goes on, I know that, and uh, these things happen, but it just seems like such a waste. Yeah, it seemed like such a waste for for 58,000 people to get killed in Vietnam, too, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And what did we accomplish from it? Nothing. I have a t-shirt that says, uh, we were winning when I left. So it's kind of uh, so like, what were you guys doing afterwards? Let me, I may come back to combat, okay. but for now, mm -hmm. when you came home, Tell me about your homecoming of sorts and um, transitioning from combat back into civilian life. Uh, the, uh, it was a... Um, I, I didn't run into any problems that I read or heard about as far as being called the baby killer or, or getting trash thrown on me or anything like that. But... Um, it, no one was, uh, only my dad and my uncle were proud of me that I had gone off, off to war. Um, it, coming home, I flew into Travis Air Force Base outside of San Francisco, and uh, then I was scheduled to fly to Kansas City, but there was a snowstorm in Kansas City, and I, uh, we got as far as... Uh, Salt Lake City. We stayed there for a day and we were finally able to fly in the next day, but we were the only plane to land at uh, Kansas City Airport that day because the snow and ice was so bad. And uh, the, the roads were terrible, but my dad was there and it was, he was going to be there no matter what. You know, he was really proud of me. That's, uh, that made me feel good because it's like you felt like it was I had done something, fought for the country like I was supposed to, things like that. What about coming from combat? I hear sometimes it's like I was in combat and several days later I'm back and yeah, you, it was too peaceful, too fast. Did you go through any of that? Yeah, you know, you have to, you can't, you can't sit there at the dinner table and say, pass the effing butter, you know, because that's what you were saying two days ago, but you know you can't do it now because your mom's there. But 
Uh, was it too fast? Yeah. It was, uh, yeah, I just saw guys dead, blown apart three, four, five days before. And, uh, but it, once again, at the time, it seemed like the right thing to do. You wanted to come home. You didn't care what. I don't want. I don't want to be in isolation for you know 20 days while I get my mind straight. You know, I want to go home. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think one thing that World War II and Iraq currently. One thing that they're doing that uh, helps recovery from that, from the combat experience, is that they're shipping people over in units. Entire units go over and entire units come back. So you've got your friends with you and you can talk about all these things. In the Vietnam War, we went over individuals and were plugged into a unit and then we were plugged out. So uh, it was, uh, for the most part, you didn't know who you were, who you were next to. It, and it makes a big difference if you're at war and you know the guy next to you, you've been living with him for six months or a year, even before you got to combat. It makes a really big difference. So I think mentally, traumatically, that they'll probably do better um, coming back from war as a group, as opposed to one person they just grab out of there and say, go home. You know, because you, you're not, you're going home and you're wondering what's going on. You don't have anyone to talk to, you know. So I, I, I think they learned, or I think they've, I hope that they've learned that this is, that's probably the best way to do it. Um. Yeah. I agree with that, yeah. Um, as far as, you know, being a veteran of Vietnam and fighting for your country, what does freedom mean to you? And, and tell me about the price of freedom. Freedom is uh, being able to go to the store and get some milk and the freedom is able to uh, well I have a letter here that I wrote 39 and a half years ago to my grandparents and um, I just this is the first time I read it was just a few hours ago and um, uh, I say in that letter um, that uh, let me see. Uh, may God bless you, all of America and the world at this Christmas. I was 18 years old. I, there was also um, something here about, um, uh, I wrote something about uh, these people. Uh, I will be happy knowing that I will be here so you will be able to have Christmas and New Year's without having to worry about where the next meal will come from or about the communists telling you what to do like it is over here for these people. I get a lot of satisfaction knowing what I'm doing over there or over here. In fact, this is the best Christmas I have ever had knowing people in the States can have a happy holiday season because I am over here. I think this is the best job a man could ever have, but I hope all the people understand why we are over here. I know you do. Thank you. So it's, um, I was 18 years old and I was uh, doing the right thing. I, you know, I felt like I was doing the right thing and uh, I was uh, protecting the country from, uh, so people could have their individual freedoms and uh, we still have our individual freedoms now and, it, and uh, part of that is we're standing up to whatever terrorism or communism or whatever the problem is and we, st we can stand up to it. I, I, so freedom is, is not free but it, it's a wonderful thing to have. And, uh, it's just worth it. You know, you know. Tell me about the American flag, what it means and represents to you as a veteran. It's probably uh, 
Well, it is the most beautiful flag of, of all the flags. Um, and I know a lot about the flag. I learned a lot about when I was growing up. And, and, and so it, every time you see it, you know the 13 states and why there are 13 stripes and why there's a field of blue and why there's stars. And, and um, uh, I'm very proud of the flag. I, I, there's a flag flying at my front door right now, a great big flag. Uh, uh, I'm proud to be a veteran and proud, proud of the flag. And uh, I, I don't think uh, anyone could be any prouder than I am. So it, it's, it's, it's a great thing. Tell me about the Vietnam Wall. Have you ever been back there? Three times, yes. Can you tell me the first time you went and what you felt? Yeah. Um, the first time I went, I, I had heard, uh, it was a couple of years after it opened, and um, uh, which was like 25 years ago. But uh, I had heard a lot of guys say that they, they were crying and stuff when they went down there. I don't cry, so you know I, I'm not going to cry. And so uh, I walked down there, and um, without even anyone saying anything or seeing anything, just the spirit of it just caused me to start crying as soon as I got down in there. And uh, uh, it was uh, very emotional. There was just a spirit there. There was. Uh, uh, a feeling of uh, man, this is this is incredible. This is just a, it's a very incredible monument. Uh, and each time I've been there, I've been in tears. Uh, I, I'm practically in tears now. You know, just to to think about it. But <clears throat> I, I think it's amazing that the wall was designed by a Vietnamese girl and that uh, she was able to capture all of this in one fell swoop. I think it's the, one of the greatest monuments ever. Um, and I also feel like it, it's too bad that some people can't go there to see it. Some people can't afford to go. Some of the, some of the veterans can't afford to go. Uh, that's why they have the the traveling wall, uh, but it still isn't like the real thing. But I, it was very moving. Steve, how did Vietnam change you as a person? I was able to, I felt more like um, I had a place in the world. I felt like I was a man. I could think on my feet, I could be alone, I didn't have to have friends, and uh, I felt like I could do anything. But it also made me seek out that high I talked about from living through the firefight and that excitement, that adrenaline rush, um, <clears throat> made me try to, to seek that out. And, and I was a police officer, rode motorcycles, flew airplanes, and anything that was dangerous, I. I tried it, or I've done it. I ski water and snow ski as fast as I can each time, and um, not that I'm trying to hurt myself. It's just that uh, trying to get that. Oh, you live through it. You know, I had a wreck on my Harley last year, about a year ago, and I, I lived through it, and it's uh, pretty amazing. Just because I see other wrecks that aren't. New, nearly as bad and guys die so um, so I don't know I, I guess I'm here for for a reason and uh, I'm not sure what that is but I think my wife's a big part of it so well, why do you think you came back from Vietnam along those lines a lot of people didn't did you ever were ever bothered yeah, by that incredibly or? bothered by guilt uh, that's when working with psychiatrists and stuff about PTSD, that's one of my biggest problems was uh, the guilt that I came back and they didn't. The guilt that um, they only lived 20 years of their life and here I've lived uh, since then twice as long as they were even alive and uh, all the things that they missed. And there was a lot of guilt. There was a lot of guilt of uh, that. Um, uh, 
why one person was shot and one person wasn't, why I could stand next to someone and uh, they be shot and me not, and the bullets are just flying around us. Uh, they they didn't have uh, any eyes on him. They just hit him and didn't hit me. And why they killed, why, why Terry got killed that night instead of me or whatever, it's, it's, it's hard to say, uh, but the guilt, yeah, I had a lot of problems with that. Yeah, and I think a lot of guys do. But I, I find it more so with guys who are in a lot of combat, they have a lot more guilt, uh, guilt problems. Uh, yeah, because the guys weren't gonna come home, or when they did come home, they're, they're messed up. And you, I came home basically like I left, except mentally, but uh, didn't have anything very, did, I have all my arms and legs, and so. What were some of the hardest, harder sights you saw over there, without getting, you know, real gross, but just, you mentioned horrible stories or average stories. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about, you know, I've heard a lot of things, whether yeah. I use it or not, but I'm right. kind of wondering if... Um, uh, the, um, we were pinned down for two days on a sandbar by the Viet Cong. We couldn't get helicopters in, and we we couldn't get out of there. Uh, during that time, the temperature reached 118 degrees, and it was even hotter because you're on that sand. And uh, a couple of guys got killed, and they got killed where we couldn't get their bodies right away, so they laid out there. And then when we were able to have the control of the area, then it's time to to get the choppers in and to get them out of there. And so uh, they want us people to volunteer to go out there and get them. And I mean, it wasn't hazardous or, or anything. It was all safe and stuff. But no one wanted to go out there because they knew what the, uh, what, what the body does after, after a couple of days in that heat. And no one wanted to go. And pretty soon, no one volunteered. So, the the gunnery sergeant in charge of our unit, he he came over to where we were all sitting, and he said, uh, "Wouldn't you want someone to? Wouldn't you want someone to to pick you up if if that was you laying out there?" So I said, "Yeah," and I got up and went out there, but it wasn't a pleasant thing, yeah. you know. It was very unpleasant, and uh, yeah, I don't need to get gross, but it's it's. Uh, I've heard some stories. I understand, but what yeah. about like with the helicopters and the medevacs? Did it get chaotic at time, or I mean, or was it it's, pretty uh, organized? Was it organized chaos, or I mean, the choppers coming in, coming out? Yeah, it was. It was always organized in chaos. Uh, people running, people throwing things, throwing bodies, throwing people, throwing wounded people. You wanted to get the choppers in and get them out. Sometimes the helicopters didn't even touch the ground. They would hover one or two feet off the ground because they were able to get up and get going faster. So, so you're throwing things on there. There's so much blood in them sometimes that it's washing out like it's in a sink or something. The blood just splattering out. And uh, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's it's organized in chaos. Uh, everybody knew what they're going to do when the chopper came in. Uh, who was going to grab what and who was going to do? So it, so it was organized. But if you watched it from afar, you'd say, "Those guys, they don't know what they're doing." But you're in and you're out. Maybe you could load up six wounded guys take off some mail or something from the helicopter in about 10 seconds, you know, if, if you're organized. So, yeah. Are there sights, sounds, or smells that bring back Vietnam today? Yes, all of that, but mainly I would say there's, you never forget the smell of death. You never forget the smell of napalm. Uh, the, the, the napalm burning the grass, burning the, this is a vegetation it has a uh, unique smell, and sometimes when you smell grass, wet grass burning, then I'll I'll think back to that. The uh, the sights and sounds. 
I've been pretty good until this Iraq war came up. And uh, it's just like it, just like it was then. It's just uh, everybody wants the troops to be okay, but they don't think we should be over, not everybody, but a lot of people don't think we should be there, but they don't know how to get out of it. That's the way we were in, in the Vietnam War. They, the people, there was a student movement at the time to, to get the troops out of there, and, but no one knew how to do it. So, so each time you see the news on that, yeah, that brings back, oh man, I know just what they're going through, you know. Um, the um, loud popping noises, suddenly I have dreams, nightmares, my wife thinks I'm crazy, so. Uh, <laughs> um, there's, helicopters. No, I can hear helicopters. That's fine. I, 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 it doesn't bother me. I, I can usually tell what type of chopper that it is by the sound it makes. And uh, no, it's it's fine. Um, Once a marine, always a marine. Yes, sir. No kidding. Yeah, that's the way it is. There's a there's a small group of guys who were able to be there and. Um, we know each other, and uh, we know what, what we've been through, and um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a group of it's a group of guys that uh, lived through it. Y you know, even it, it takes a special person just to get through through boot camp. Uh, it's that's a hard thing, and. Um, but I loved it. I, I still love it. I'm very proud that I was there. How about the camaraderie of the Marine Corps? I mean, in Vietnam, I think I might have asked you that, but obviously as a Marine, it's, it's a brotherhood. Yeah, we, we, um, uh, we were in San Diego two or three years ago on the Marine Corps birthday, and uh, there was a bunch of young Marines there having a party. And when they found out that I had served in Vietnam, they all came up to me and thanked me and congratulated me and stuff. And it's a, it's a unique family group, yeah. You know, you, you know that uh, everybody knows that you went through the boot camp, you went through the training, it's unique. My brother called me when he joined the Air Force and uh, he said he was in boot camp, and I said, well, how is it? He said, well, we're in these two-man rooms, and I go, that's not boot camp. You can't have a two-man room when you're in boot camp. Oh, there's a big difference between the Army and the Navy, you know, uh, so, yeah, we're proud. We're a proud group of people. Yeah. One more thing, at the end of my interviews, I asked the veterans to give me a salute into the camera from where you're seated, so when I tell you to, can you do that? Yeah, you sure can. Give me just a half a second here. Yeah. Okay, Steve, right in the camera, go ahead. Great, thanks.